It is therefore now time for a question period. The member from Nipissing. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. I'd like to begin, Speaker, by offering our hope and prayers to the families affected by the tragedy on the 400 yesterday, especially to the Dunn family of North Bay, where nine children lost their father yesterday, Benjamin Dunn, and we will pray for this shocked and traumatized family. Speaker, uh, my question this morning is for the Finance Minister. Every day this week, we have learned more and more disturbing news regarding the great Canadian gaming's trouble in BC. Of concern here in Ontario is the fact that the OPP are, quote, reaching out to investigators in BC about the money laundering investigation. Speaker, is the minister doing anything further other than, quote, watching closely? Thank you. <laughs> minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, <coughs> the uh, the AGCO, our agencies, our, the OLG, they have been in constant contact with the regulators in British Columbia. They have been uh, recognizing uh, the requirements to have proponents uh, to be approved by the AGCO in consultations with the BC authorities prior to even performing and making their submissions. So, Mr. Speaker, the process is, in, is apparent, it's open, it's transparent, and it precludes the minister from engaging with those proponents, even those that are friends of the Conservative Party, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. I will not associate myself with any of them until the decision is made openly with a fairness uh, monitor, Answer. and that is being done, Mr. Speaker, on an ongoing basis. The continuations of any review is appropriate. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Uh, while the minister is watching on the sidelines, speaker, others have been working. Yesterday, we learned of the latest twist regarding the company awarded the casino contract here in Ontario. Media reports have now revealed questionable trading activity by one of Great Canadian's directors. Neil, Bark Neil Baker earned almost $140 million selling shares in late 2016. That happened three months after a report was submitted to the B.C. Attorney General implicating the casino in allegations of money laundering. That report wasn't made public until September 2017. Speaker, I would ask the minister if he was aware of the questionable trading activity before they awarded the casino deal here in Ontario. Thank you. Minister. So information that is provided to the AGCO and to all its regulatory authorities was made, and uh, implications and any activity that engages uh, with suspicious activity is being reported, and those decisions are cleared by the AGCO prior to a proponent being authorized. They were authorized both by the BC authorities and the Ontario uh, regulatory authorities, Mr. Speaker, and so the process is in place. If there is inappropriate activity by any director, by any individual, in any institution, in regards to any money laundering initiatives, be it in gaming or be it in banking or being in any other institutions across this province, they have to adhere to those laws, and those things are being enforced. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplement. Minister, well, here are the cold, hard facts. A director of Great Canadian Gaming sheds his shares between the time a report of money laundering allegations is submitted to BC's Attorney General and the time the report is made public. In the report are allegations that workers in a BC casino knowingly accepted millions of dollars in suspicious cash transactions, which could have been the proceeds of crime. The integrity of Ontario's gaming industry is at stake here. We have learned the Ontario Casino Agreement allows for the termination in the event of something prejudicial to the reputation or integrity of OLG, Casino Gaming, or the Ontario government. Speaker, is the minister finally going to stand up for Ontario and halt this deal? Thank you. Minister. So I have been standing up for Ontario, Mr. Speaker. I've been standing up for Ontario to modernize the gaming operations for the benefit of Ontarians to provide for more incoming for hospitals and schools and host communities, Mr. Speaker. The matter that's before us isn't one about the sensitivity of the commercial activity of a public company. The matter before us is this member is talking about the individual activity of a person. 
and that person, if it is in fact is suspicious, should be reviewed and should be enforced. But Great Canadian, as a corporation, Madam Mr. Speaker, has abided, and they, I believe, are not under investigation. But the uh, activities of within that company should be reviewed. In fact, Ontario has led in many respects on socially responsible activities to protect individuals, protect communities, and we will continue to abide yes, and maintain the highest standards in this province for gaming in a socially responsible manner. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Finance Minister. These allegations are exactly why this casino deal must be halted immediately. Let's take a few minutes to review what we've learned just in this week alone, Speaker. Internal government documents reveal a $500 million money laundering investigation in BC. We read about, quote, suspicions of terrorist financing, possible organized crime connections, hockey bags full of cash, tens of millions of dollars in $20 bills. The RCMP investigation goes back to 2015. They said there was about $220 million laundered in BC in one year alone. Speaker, to the Finance Minister, what did he know and when did he know it? Thank you. Minister? What I know is this, Mr. Speaker. In this industry, a lot of proponents are jockeying to get into Ontario. A lot of them want to be the proponents of choice. A lot of them have been donors of the Conservative Party, Mr. Speaker. A lot of them are now feeding the Conservative Party with allegations from Great Canadian. I am not going to fall prey to this. I am going to, cons I am going to assure that there's full transparency that Great Canadian, as a public company, is operating in an effective manner. If there's any impropriety whatsoever, we will immediately act upon it, Mr. Speaker. But I am not going to fall prey to allegations and any lynching that this member is trying to again do to the good people of Canada, because whatever happened in British Columbia happened. What's happening in Ontario will going to protect the interests of Ontarians. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. Well, perhaps the minister's reluctance to act has something to do with what we learned next, Speaker. According to the Integrity Commissioner, high-ranking, well-connected Liberal insiders were hired to lobby the Premier and that minister. Is this why the Liberals rushed ahead with the deal? Is this why they won't halt this deal? The bid process began back in 2013 after the government's decision to kill the horse racing industry. Between then and now, Liberal insiders were hired to pull the strings. Speaker to the minister, is this the real reason he won't ha act on behalf of this deal? Minister. Totally offensive, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite is now doing a drive-by smear. He's drive-by smear of, of individuals who are registered lobbyists in our province. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's, uh, it's astounding that the current lobbyist for Great Canadian is a former Conservative, Mr. Speaker. They're the ones that have actually been acting upon it. In fact, their, their, their most newest candidate is a former president of OLG, Mr. Speaker, another Conservative who is acting on this very matter of modernization. The member alleges on individuals who are not registered lobbyists for Great Canadian during this process. It's offensive, and he should retract that comment, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. To the minister, no Speaker, objection. all this. Stop the clock. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, come to order. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, come to order. All this government needed to do was admit there are problems in BC Chief and halt government the deal whip. until they get to the bottom of it. Instead, they deny any involvement. But senior Liberal insiders working on behalf of the casino operator show us a different story. Once again, the Liberals put themselves and their insiders ahead of the people of Ontario. There are money laundering allegations, questionable rate trading activity, well placed. Minister of Municipal Affairs, come to order. We're now in warnings. We're in warnings. Carry on. 
well-placed liberal insiders at the center of it all. Speaker, like many other issues here, this one does not pass the smell test. I asked the minister, what's the priority for this government? Liberal insiders or the integrity of Ontario's gaming industry? Thank you. Minister. Well, wow, Mr. Speaker, I have already made clear. Great Canadian has come out identifying that there were no Liberal uh, lobbyists involved. In fact, they are Conservative uh, lobbyists that are involved. Uh, furthermore, uh, those that I've identified have said they've removed themselves. And, and it's no surprise that the member opposite is looking for improprietary activities, given that they engage in that almost every day in their nomination battles, Mr. Speaker. We getting any political influence here. The member opposite is conflating the issues with criminalization. That is not happening in our side of this House, and I will protect the commercial interest of anybody who's approved as the appropriate winner of a contract. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, my uh, question is for the Acting Premier. Etobicoke General Hospital reached the alarmingly dangerous occupancy rate of 122 per cent in its acute care beds this year so far. Toronto East Michael Guerin Hospital hit 106 per cent. Trillium Health Partners, which operates three Mississauga hospitals, reached 109 per cent. And Sick Kids got as high as 107 per cent in their mental health beds, uh, and, and their mental health beds rather registered a shocking 136 per cent occupancy rate at times in 2017. None of these hospitals got to this point overnight, Speaker. Yep. And as much as this Premier's, Premier hopes they will, temporary beds are not going to solve this crisis. What is the Liberal government's plan to make sure that every person in Ontario can get to a hospital and be confident Question. that they are going to get the health care they need, not just before an upcoming election, but in the long run, Speaker? Okay. Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I have yet to hear from the leader of the 30, third, 30th party, the leader of the third party, whether she supports our investment of last week of 1,200 new acute inpatient beds across this province. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, that's the equivalent number of beds as creating six new hospitals yeah. in this province. And we made that decision in a single week, and we did it in a targeted fashion so that we actually provide those beds in the parts of the province that need them the most. And particularly in some parts of the province where we have high growth and changing demographics, we are seeing the pressures that come with an increased population and an aging population. That's why we worked closely with the Ontario Hospital Association to make that investment in six new hospitals. That equivalent number of beds. We made that announcement last week, and we are well on our way to implement Thank it. Thank you. Yeah, sure Supplementary. Well, Speaker, you know, this government has a created a crisis in our hospital system that stretches through all of our major community hospitals, is also hitting our tertiary hospitals. This crisis is hitting every hospital in this province. So six hospitals that this, pre uh, this minister talks about doesn't fix the fact that they've ruined dozens and dozens and dozens of hospitals in communities across this province with their cuts over the last decade, Speaker. Hospitals, hospitals across the north need a real plan to fix their overcrowding crisis. Hospitals in Toronto, the GTA, Hamilton, Peterborough, Barrie, Aurelia, Tilsonburg, London, across the southwest. The Premier needs to step up, Speaker, put aside her re-election bid and really focus on what the people of the province need. They need Stop the, clock. the member from Barrie will withdraw. Now you are warned. Carry on. They need her to stop with the partisan announcements and focus her time and energy on fixing the damage that the Liberal government has done to our hospitals. Will the Liberal government do that, Speaker? Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, for the uh, the member opposite to suggest that dozens 
and dozens and dozens of hospitals in this province are in ruins. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It is unbelievable, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Or like she did yesterday, to refer to the emergencies as as stacking individuals like cords of wood, Mr. Speaker. For her to use this kind of rhetoric and then suggest that we are making essential investments in our health care system, that that is somehow political, that she's got the nerve and the ability to actually use. I now understand what the NDP is doing and what the leader of the third party is doing. Her brand is crisis, Mr. Speaker. She has decided to actually dispense with anything even remotely close to the truth and create a narrative of rhetoric and fear. The member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. You're next. <coughs> Carry on. For this party and that leader to use for explicit political purposes, the narrative that she's created, which is so far from the truth, Mr. Speaker, and it just it is, it is amazing to me, but in the context of where that person, that, that leader of the third party is going, her Thank brand you. is crisis. Final supplementary. Speaker, I got to say, destruction causes crisis, and their brand is destruction, destruction of our hospital system. That's what their brand is, Speaker. Natalie Mera, the executive director of the Ontario Health Coalition, says this of the Premier's temporary beds, and I, I say this uh, in terms of what she said, that we are in such dire crisis across the province that it is not enough to meet the overflow beds that we are that are in use right now and the beds are very will do very little uh, in the big scheme of things, they're not enough to deal with the people on stretchers and hallways and they're not enough for the people waiting in ambulances to be Stop the clock. Minister of Infrastructure is warned. <laughs> I hope you're getting my message. Finish, please. The Premier's announcement last week, Speaker, is at best a band-aid, and it doesn't come close to covering the whole wound, the wound that this government created. Question. When will the Premier and her Liberal government finally take this overcrowding and hallway medicine crisis seriously and actually make sure that every Ontario family Thank has you. the health care they need, when they need it, and where Thank you. Minister. Really? Well, Mr. Speaker, again, uh, yesterday, yesterday I went through a long list coming from reliable, independent third-party experts that described appropriately our health care system as one of the best in the world. In every single indicator, we are at the top of this country or near the top of this country in performance. We have one of the best cancer systems in the world in yeah, terms of survivals here, yeah. and outcomes. Here, here. Yes. We have so much to be proud of, the 150-plus hospitals where we have tens of thousands of individuals, hardworking individuals, who are providing that highest quality of care. And for that leader of a party to actually reduce those efforts and that characteristic of our health care system, Answer. to describe it in the way she does, to denigrate it, to suggest that it is not functioning to the best of its ability, and asking us Thank not you. to make any investments, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next uh, question is to the Acting Premier, although I'd say the experts in the health care system are patients, frontline workers, nur nurses and doctors who have all been sounding the alarm bells. Last year, Toronto was named the Child Poverty Capital of Canada. Speaker, In the last 22 years, under both Conservative and Liberal governments, monthly social assistance in Ontario has gone up by just 8 per cent, and that's before you factor in inflationary erosion of that figure. An 8 per cent increase over 22 years is just not enough for a family to pay rent, buy food, clothes, school supplies for the kids, and try to scrape by. It's not enough. And the Premier and the Liberal government have done next to nothing to fix it. Why, for 14 years, has this Liberal government allowed the depth of poverty to increase, creating such destitution for Ontario families living in poverty? 
Thank you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very uh, uh, proud to, uh, to answer this uh, question from the leader of the third party. Um, the leader knows that uh, we've been working with uh, different groups across Ontario to ensure that we can uh, uh, better uh, position income security here in the province of Ontario. Uh, we've been working with um, a, a security reform working group, uh, the First Nations Income Security Reform Working Group, and the Urban Indigenous Tables and Income Security Reform to study Ontario's income security systems to make sure that we bring forward recommendations here in the province of Ontario to improve our system. And over the years, our various uh, social uh, security programs have helped a great number of people and families, but we know, Mr. Speaker, that we have to do better. Uh, so we're going to bring forward a new roadmap, uh, a report that's Answer. been uh, tabled uh, to uh, bring forward change here in the province of Ontario, and I'll uh, be able to answer some of the additional pieces in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. <laughs> well, Speaker, this morning we learned, in fact, that the Premier's advisory panel set up by the Liberal government last year to overhaul Ontario's troubled income security system will release its report today, and the report will recommend an urgent 22 per cent increase to social assistance funding over the next three years. Does the Premier and her Liberal government, uh, on the eve of an election, finally plan to follow her committee's advice and implement an urgent 22 per cent increase immediately? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, uh, the roadmap is a thoughtful, uh, thought-provoking uh, document, and I want to thank the members uh, from the working group for their valuable contributions to uh, social security reform here uh, in the province. Mr. Speaker, over the next uh, two months, uh, we'll be going across the province uh, to get public feedback on the report, and um, we're going to use this roadmap as a guide uh, to develop a multi-year plan um, for early 2018. And this plan uh, will be designed to phase in improvements in the way that this is a practical, uh, realistic, and recognizes our fiscal responsibilities as a government. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of um, this government's record when it comes to putting in place fairness in this province, and we'll continue to support the people of Ontario uh, through, uh, uh, through uh, uh, mechanisms like this when it comes to income reform. Thank you. Final supplementary. The report also recommends a 15 per cent increase to the Ontario Dis Disability Support Program, a housing benefit to be implemented by 2000. 2019, after the next election, and the expansions of all health benefits to low-income families. Given this government's dismal track record on supporting low-income families, which includes Listen up, folks. Includes cuts to homelessness prevention programs in 2012, a $100 per month cut to social assistance in 2014, and a severe cut to the local poverty reduction fund in 2015. With an election around the corner, will the Premier reverse course, implement the recommendations of this report immediately, and finally begin to support Ontario families who are really stuck struggling instead of trying to support your own election bid or your own re-election bid. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the, the leader of the third party talks about supporting families here in the province of Ontario. I'd like to ask uh, you know, her and her party, where were they when we were talking about uh, increasing the minimum wage? Where were they when we talked Nowhere. about OSAP Nowhere. reform? Nowhere. Nowhere. Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, when we started talking about increasing the minimum wage here in the province of Ontario, uh, the NDP was silent on that issue. We've put forward, uh, we've put forward plans here in the province of Ontario uh, to put in, 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 in January free. The minister will wrap up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, we'll be taking this uh, report. I can play this all day. Carry on. 
Mr. Speaker, the NDP always positions himself as working for people in Ontario, but when we talk about the important things to help families, they're usually silent on these issues. Thank you. Your question. Member from Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Acting Premier. In late 2015, SR Steel Algoma entered into CCAA creditor protection proceedings. In January of this year, during the Sioux by election, the Premier visited us and spoke with our local media. Quoting from our local Sioux Star, Wynne told reporters that she wants to see the steel industry thrive in Ontario and in Sault Ste. Marie. The province has been working to facilitate the restructuring process without overstepping its bounds. CCAA has been ongoing for three years now, and it needs to come to an end. The municipality is owed millions in back taxes, and they may reduce services or increase taxes to cover that loss. Local businesses are owed millions while the economy waits in limbo. Steelworkers and retirees are worried about the status of their pensions. It has been almost a year since the Premier made her comments to our local media. Mr. Speaker, my question for the question. Acting Premier is this. What is the government doing to help facilitate the restructuring process at Algoma, and what have they done to expedite that restructuring process? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Thank you. Uh, to the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Well, one of the things that would have helped is if the members opposite would have voted in support of some of the reforms that were taking place to protect pensioners, Mr. Speaker. They voted against those measures in our budget. And as we move forward with our steel industry and how critical it is, we did something extraordinary in helping Stelco in, in, in their outcomes to protect the pensioners as well as retirees and the workers. Now, Algoma is now going through that process, and I appreciate the concern the member opposite has because it affects his own community. And we know how difficult it is for members in that community to go through this transition. They're having ongoing discussions now with, with uh, their creditors, who are the ones engaged in this process. It's before the courts. Uh, the province of Ontario will be part of this to the extent of protecting the pensioners and their pensions as we move forward, and that's why we've taken many uh, reforms to protect uh, pensioners. And in regards to the priorities, this I'll deal with in the supplementary. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again to the Acting Premier, so the answer to that question was obviously nothing. Here on Central Railway is vital in delivering product to market in Northern Ontario. This Stop the clock. The Huron Central Line services major employers and economic drivers in Sault Ste. Marie and the Algoma Manitoulin ridings. Our steel plant depends on this rail line. I'm in frequent, frequent contact with Huron Central discussing a fatal problem they face. If upgraded infrastructure funding is not approved immediately, they will be forced to close the service. To again quote the Premier's by-election trip to Sault Ste. Marie when discussing the future of the steel industry. A diversified economy is also part of that future success, and the transportation hub can play a role in that diversification. The Premier met with Huron Central just last week, and she refused to provide funding. Northern Ontario's economy depends on this Question. train. Our workers depend on these jobs, and yet a time of great need, she turned her back on us. Mr. Speaker, how can we take them seriously whenever they, word they say lacks the action to back it up? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Nothing is what that member and that party opposite did when we looked to support uh, the steel industry, Mr. Speaker. We provided and we have helped the steel industry and we provided for uh, more integrity. We recognize the challenges it's facing globally. It's why we stepped in. It's why we were arm in arm with the workers and that's why we're continuing to do the same in Algoma, Mr. Speaker. So we have taken the steps that permits those pensioners to be protected. The member opposite citing the priority claims from CCAA that the the federal government under the Conservative regime rejected to even, dis to even discuss, Mr. Speaker, when the Senate perform uh, provided for legislation in that regard. So, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to work with the industry. We recognize how important it is to Ontario's economy. It is a priority. We're actually having those discussions, even in our NAFTA negotiations, with the federal government. The member opposite has a right to issue concerns. But he also has a right to his community to work with us to provide for the change that we're putting forward to protect his own constituents. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Question, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. This week we saw another tragic accident on Highway 400. 
involving 14 vehicles and at least three people died. Our thoughts and prayers are with their families. OPP Sergeant Kerry Smith referred to the accident scene as absolutely carnage and devastation. Unfortunately, this is not the only fatality that's happened on this highway with trucks. In the last two years, there's been 1,400 collisions with commercial trucks and 155 people have died. Fewer truck inspection points, truck tires becoming airborne, and poor winter highway maintenance has created a serious problem with highway safety in the province of Ontario, a problem the NDP has been raising for years. A co-host of Breakfast Television tweeted to Minister Del Duca and I regarding this crash, asking, how many more truck-related crashes and fireballs do we have to have to have an inquest? Does the acting premier have an answer for him Thank and to you. the people of Ontario? Deputy Premier. Minister of Infrastructure. Minister of Infrastructure. Uh, speaker, I thank the member for the question, and uh, uh, our thoughts, like the member from uh, Nipissing, Mr. Speaker, are with the families and friends of the victims in this horrific tragedy. And on behalf of the Minister of Transportation, I would also like to thank our first responders who were on the scene. Uh, we know how hard they work when responding to tragedies like this, Mr. Speaker. As we do with all serious incidents on our highway, Speaker, the Ministry of Transportation will review the results of the police investigation to determine if there are additional safety measures we need to consider. And, Speaker, the member will know that uh, it's the chief coroner in Ontario who has a discretion to call an inquest. And uh, I would be very surprised, Mr. Speaker, if that is not under consideration, at least at this particular point. And, Mr. Speaker, in my supplementary, I'll Answer. talk to uh, truck safety on our highways as well. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Acting Premier. I'm not the only one that has concerns about safety of Ontario trucking industry. OPP Commissioner Vince Hawks asked the Ontario trucking industry to take a close look at the way they conduct business. The Ontario Safety League is asking the Liberal government to begin a coroner's inquest in this horrible accident. Speaker, Speaker, our first responders see firsthand the devastation impact that our unsafe highways are having on the people of the province of Ontario. Commissioner Hawks has gone on to say that the trucks on our, our roads are essential Missiles traveling down the highway. Missiles. And that trend seems to be getting worse. Will the Premier listen to Mr. Hawks and the Ontario Safety League immediately conduct a review of the Ontario trucking driving industry Question. and order a coroner's inquest? Thank you. Yep. Minister. Mr. Speaker, one fatality is one fatality too much, Mr. Speaker, on our highways. And Ontario is a leader in truck safety standards and enforcement, but we're always looking for ways, Mr. Speaker, to make our roads even safer. The number of deadly collisions on our roads involving large trucks has been declining, not, as the member suggests, despite growing truck traffic. And we are committed to making sure our roads stay safe when it comes to truck traffic, and a critical part of that is making sure the truck drivers are properly trained. That is why we introduced just this July, Mr. Speaker, mandatory entry-level training for new commercial Class A truck drivers, which recently came into effect and is helping to ensure our roads remain among the safest in North America. And we recognize that distracted driving is a serious issue on our roads with all drivers. That is why our government has now introduced legislation that would, if passed, Answer. create tougher penalties to combat distracted driving, making Ontario the first jurisdiction in Canada to have a license suspension for those convicted of distracted driving and the toughest penalties for repeat offenders. Your question, the member from Ottawa, Vanier. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question... Member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you. My question is for a post-secondary education minister. Great things to reduce the financial barriers for entry to post-secondary education to our transformation of OSAP. But, Minister, post-secondary life, often in a new town and a new city, presents unique challenges for students. As a former dean of a law school, I know how students can get stressed and how important it is for them to have access to mental health support. We know that positive student outcomes depend on access to good mental health support. Mr. Speaker, can the minister share with this House what her ministry has done and is continuing to do 
for mental health on post-secondary campuses across Ontario. Thank you. Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Well, thank you, Speaker. And uh, the member is absolutely right. Uh, mental health is a very important issue on campus. I have visited many campuses. The issue I hear about the most, whether it's from students, from faculty, administration, Everyone agrees we need to do a better job supporting students with mental health challenges on our post-secondary campuses. Uh, speaker, I am delighted to welcome the advocates for campus mental health who are here today. They've um, issued a report called It, it Together. It is a, a unique report in that it is from Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance, the uh, College Student Alliance, the college sector and the university sector work together to create this report. It is excellent, and I thank them for that. Speaker, we've been working uh, since 2011. Um, the ministry has been a partner in Answer. the comprehensive mental health and addiction strategy, where we've done some good things, including funding 34 innovation uh, projects for mental health. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Merci, Madame la Ministre. Thank you, Madam Minister. For this incredible leadership on this issue, I know not only is it important for students, but it creates a toll on all employees in university when students suffer from mental health uh, stresses. So thank you very much for continuing to work on this issue. So I think reports have shown as well that the, the mental health requirements are increasing. That is, for students of all ages, access to mental health support is important, it's not only the young people, but also all the students that are on campuses. So, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the minister if she could please inform this House on what the ministry is continuing to do to meet the ongoing and growing need for mental health on campuses in Ontario. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, I was very happy this year to announce uh, with the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care a $6 million increase to dedicated funding for mental health supports to enhance mental health services on campuses. This will bring our total funding to $15 million a year for um, uh, mental health, an increase of over 60 per cent from last year. As part of this funding, we're investing almost $4.5 million in the Mental Health Worker Grant Program to hire mental health workers at all public post-secondary institutions. The speaker, this is not the only action our government has taken. Our students are going to benefit greatly from OHIP Plus. It will provide free um, the prescription medications for everyone under the age of 25 in Ontario. Answer. Speaker, our government recognizes the, the serious importance of this issue. We will continue to work with all of our partners to improve accessibility and quality of mental health support Thank on you. campus. New question. The member from Scarborough Rouge River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Deputy Premier. During the Scarborough by-election, your government bragged about Scarborough subway, but you have failed to deliver any transit north of Highway 401 in Scarborough. Mr. Speaker, I repeat, in my community, there... Minister, the environment and climate change is warned. Stop. <laughs> if different acknowledgement is necessary, I'll accept. <coughs> Seeing none. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I repeat, in my community, there has been absolutely no transit expansion during the time this Liberal government has been in office. Recently, the Premier appointed Shelley Carroll as a candidate in Don Valley North. Ms. Carroll is a loud opponent to the Scarborough subway project. Deputy no Premier, question. will your government continue to stall on construction on the Shepherd's uh, Scarborough subway to make Shelley Carroll happy? Thank you. Minister, Minister of Infrastructure. Minister of Infrastructure. 
Mr. Speaker, strange things happen in this place. <laughs> we, we seem to have a recollection, and I'm reminded by the uh, member beside me from Scarborough, that uh, that member, when he was on Toronto City Council, voted against the subway. Oh. So, 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 Mr. Speaker. Mr. He fails to recognize, Mr. Speaker, that it takes time to plan, to do the financing, to do the procurement. Mr. Speaker, it's not going to happen tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. We are on that file, Mr. Speaker. We have said we are going to go forward with it, Mr. Speaker, and there's nothing else we can do other than cooperate with the City of yes, Toronto, sir. cooperate with Infrastructure Ontario to go move forward to make this happen. And I'm very, very pleased to hear that you now support. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I could put my hand on Bible. Every time survey issue come up uh, in the council, I strongly support it. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this is just more talk and no action by this failed government. Frankly, it's all hard to believe. During election, My resolve hasn't changed. Please. Keep your yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. During election, they promised great ideas, but after election, they failed to deliver. Not only that, they ignored them. And this is why I'm here today in this legislature. The only action that the Liberal Party has taken is appointing a candidate who is firmly against the Scarborough subway. Deputy Premier, Question. can you government and your candidate in Don Valley North come clean and admit that you simply do not support the Shopper subway in Scarborough? Thank you. <clears throat> Minister. Mr. Speaker, it was great, with great pleasure that I refer this to the uh, member from Scarborough Centre. Thank you. To be done properly, simply refer to the other minister, please. Economic Development and Growth Speaker. And, and maybe his good friend Doug Ford would remember this very clearly because it was on TV. It, it, was, it was taking place during the council agenda when you were criticizing Doug Ford for building the Scarborough Chair, subway. Please. Chair, uh, The member was criticizing Doug Ford for building the Scarborough subway. So his recollection may be different than his brand new friend Doug Ford's recollection of that <laughs> issue. But what I want to say on behalf of the members that are on this side of the House these members fought very hard to ensure, despite the challenges going on when that member was at the city, of the city continually changing their position on this, we stood strong for the Scarborough subway. This government stood strong for the Scarborough subway. Every single member from Scarborough here stood strong for the Scarborough subway. It's going to happen. It's being built. It's on time. It's going to be on budget. It's going to be delivered, despite the fact that member that didn't support it in the first place, despite what that member says, Mr. Can you see it, please? Can you see it, please? New question. The member from Timiskamikok. My question is to the Minister of Health. Yesterday in the Timmins Daily Press, Dr. George Frumlich described some of the risks that his patients are facing because of the lack of hospital funding in northeastern Ontario. A child at risk of attempting suicide waited for two weeks at Bingham Memorial Hospital in Matheson before there was any beds in the mental health unit in Timmins. Another patient in Matheson had a broken hip but did not have any surgery for several days because, again, there were no beds at Timmins and District Hospital. Minister, this government has been in power for 14 years. 
Why has it chosen to continue to underfund hospitals and put patients at risk? Thank you. Mr. Pelt, long -term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as the member knows, we increased our hospitals operating budget by $500 million uh, this year in the budget. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to Timmins as well, they importantly uh, and specifically were included uh, in the announcement that I made uh, last week of the creation of the equivalent number of beds of six new hospitals across the province. So those 1,200 acute care beds, which of course are in addition to approximately 600 other transitional beds that we're making available, but those 1,200 acute care beds include an allocation of beds for Timmins. And even more than that, there's an additional as yet to be allocated complement of beds for the Northeast Lynn, which of course Timmins is under consideration for receiving additional bed beds beyond what was announced last week. So yes, these sir. are important investments. I know that party does not want us to make any investments apparently between now and next June when we have an election. We will make the right investments at the right Thank time. You. Despite what they say. Thank you. Supplementary. Once again to the Minister. Dr. Frutlich has been practicing in Matheson since 1994. He is a respected pillar in the community. I would like to quote him. In the past, it was most unusual to have no beds. Now it is unusual when you get a bed. Referring to the new beds, those eight beds will fill up in no time, and we will again be back to square one. I cannot assure you 100% that nobody has died because of lack of beds." End of quote. Wow. Minister, you have accused the NDP of fear-mongering on hospital overcrowding. In your opinion, is Dr. Frudlich fear-mongering as well? <laughs> you it, please. You it, please. Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, we increased the budget this year of Timmins Hospital by $1.6 million. And, and, Mr. and, Mr. Speaker, as well, so I have before me the capacity figures for all hospitals across this province from April, uh, monthly, from April through to, through to and including September. And for not a single month was Timmins Hospital above capacity, Mr. Wow. Speaker. Notwithstanding that, we understand that there continue to be pressures across our hospitals, a number of them for various reasons. Sometimes it's because of growth in the lo local population. Sometimes it's because of the aging population and their complex needs. But the allocation that I announced last week that go to specifically to uh, Timmins Hospital, but in addition, there are 31 additional as yet unallocated beds which have been funded and have been announced that are available to Timmins and other hospitals as they Thanks, require sir. them. And Mr. Speaker, we will make those investments as we have the 1,200 acute care inpatient beds that we announced Thank last you. week, and we'll continue to make similar investments. New question, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Honourable Minister of Research, Innovation and Science. Coming from a riding whose motto is where history and innovation th thrive, I am naturally gravitating towards all of the amazing articles about innovation in the province of Ontario. In fact, I'm surprised that people who have not yet taken to calling you Mr. Innovation. Uh -huh. But I also know that innovation is one of three hats that you typically wear, and I would personally like to hear a little more about research in our province. Medical research in the province is coordinated by the Ontario Research Fund, a two-stream program supporting research excellence and research infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, could the Honourable Minister please tell the members of this House about the work he's been doing to ensure Ontario is engaging in top-notch research in our province of Question. Ontario? Thank, thank you. you. Minister of Research, Innovation thank and you, Science. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Kingston and Islands for that question, Mr. Speaker. I also want to thank her uh, for that uh, nickname. Uh, uh, terrific <laughs> nickname. Uh, thank you. Mr. Speaker, since uh, 2003, I have been hard at work making sure that Ontario scientists and the researchers are being supported through the Ontario Research Fund, and that support has made them widely competitive. Yes. Mr. Speaker, the competition and collaboration has fostered discoveries which led to innovative technologies, treatment for patients, and advances in sciences, all the while supporting very high-quality jobs in our province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Research Fund has been an incredible success, and we will build on that success with the Ontario Research Fund review, 
uh, the, the first meeting of which is scheduled for tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm delighted and, in fact, honoured to have this question. I have seen that we can count on this government to build on past successes and look for new ways to run programs efficiently and maximise their value. I have also seen that this is what our ministers believe in, setting high expectations, delivering on those goals and raising the bar. Mr. Speaker, support for research is absolutely critical to maintaining Ontario's reputation as a research-friendly province. Absolutely. That reputation attracts more researchers, research institutes, business and foreign direct investment, which results in more high-paying, high-quality jobs for Ontarians today and Ontarians tomorrow. That is particularly important in my riding of Kingston and the Islands with three post-secondary institutions, Queen's University, St. Lawrence College and Question. Royal Military College. Mr. Speaker, could the minister tell the members more about the Ontario Research Fund and the Ontario Research Fund review? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to thank the member from uh, Kingston and the Island, not only for her question, but her advocacy for those three very, very internationally well-regarded institutions in her writing, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Research Fund is an excellent program that to date has invested about $1.8 billion towards research projects. These investments go towards projects like scalpel free surgery projects that speed up recovery times and reduce healthcare burdens, and research into cancer attacking viruses that have no means to defend themselves, and the research into the effect of wind on structures in our urban areas that could optimize wind farms. Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, we plan to build on these investments by starting a review of the Ontario Research Fund. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Several college and university groups are at Queen's Park today to emphasize the critical need, Speaker, for an integrated mental health strategy on student mental health. Speaker, a 2016 survey of 25,000 students conducted by the Ontario University and College Health Association found this. 46% of students reporting feeling so depressed it was difficult to function, up from 40% in 2013. 65% of students reported experiencing overwhelming anxiety, up from 58% in 2013. And most pressing speaker, is that 13% of students have seriously considered suicide in the previous year, up from 10% in 2013. Speaker, will the Liberal government commit today to preparing an integrated mental health Question. strategy to address student mental health on community college and university campuses? Thank you. Minister of Education and Skills well, Development. Thank you, Speaker, and I think this is an issue that all three parties agree passionately about. And I, I do want to say thank you to the people who spoke at the breakfast meeting this morning, the students who have lived experience of mental health challenges, who uh, spoke very eloquently of, uh, of their journey. Speaker, we are absolutely committed to building a more responsive, uh, more coordinated mental health system on our campuses with links to the community sector. Speaker. Uh, I think it's a responsibility we have to our students to ensure that they can be the very best they can be. And as our Minister of Health says frequently, there is no health without mental health. So we have made important investments. I'll speak to them more in the supplementary. But there is more to do, Speaker, and I know yes, I can count on the support of all parties as we work to address this challenge. Thank you. <laughs> supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Minister, money alone cannot remedy this crisis. Students, community colleges and universities want a mental health strategy developed to deal with the crisis that exists on campuses. Colleges and universities support their students as best they are able. But again, money alone cannot remedy this crisis. Speaker, will the Liberal government answer the call from students and Ontario's colleges and universities and help them to address student mental health by developing and implementing 
an integrated mental health strategy here in Ontario. Um, speaker, I agree that money alone does not solve this problem, but money sure does help. And that's why we increased funding by 60 per cent last year alone, dedicated to campus mental health services. Speaker. Uh, let me talk about some of the investments that we've made and the impact it's had. We established Good to Talk, Allo J'écoute, a 24-7 bilingual helpline service that offers direct counselling and referral students to young people. To date, more than 77,000 students have accessed that speaker. The Centre for Innovation in Mental Health and Campus Mental Health is a knowledge exchange hub. They funded more than 30 unique and innovative mental health-related projects that we are learning from. Speaker, the Mental Health Workers Grant uh, is dedicated funding to increase the number of frontline service and the accessibility of service services. We take this Answer. issue extremely carefully. As I have said, it's the number one issue everywhere I go, and I look forward to the support of both opposition parties. Thank you. Your question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, the actions that have been taken by this government to address campus mental health have clearly been ineffective in addressing student mental health needs. Over the last five years, the number of college and university students with identified mental health issues has more than doubled at Ontario campuses. This has led to an unprecedented collaboration among four organizations representing almost the entire post-secondary sector, who released a comprehensive report this morning with 26 recommendations to address this crisis in campus mental health. These partners, the College Student Alliance, the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance, Colleges University and the Council of Ontario Universities, are urging this government to act now to implement a whole-of-community approach to the mental health needs of students. Question. Will this government commit today to doing the right thing and implementing these crucial recommendations Immediately. Thank you. Thank you. I think the member from London West has proven my point. We are all united on this issue. We all believe that campus mental health is important and that we need to do more when it comes to making sure students get the support they need. Uh, as I've said, Speaker, we are all in this together. We are, in, as government, as colleges, as universities, student groups, community services, we are all in this together. The recommendations from this, as, as the member says, unprecedented collaboration uh, are, uh, are excellent recommendations. We will take them very, very seriously. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker, again to the Acting Premier. Speaker, this morning a panel of young people shared their experiences with the lack of services for campus mental health. They talked about escalating rates of student suicide, a chronic shortage of counsellors. They talked about being referred to community mental health services and waiting eight months or more for an appointment. Shameful. Three specific priorities were highlighted by the panelists. The need to recognize post-secondary students as a distinct population cohort, the need for sustainable funding to support peer-to-peer -peer programming with trained volunteers at every post-secondary campus, and the need to integrate resiliency in children and youth through mandatory K-12 mental health and wellness curriculum. Speaker, lives are at stake and urgent action is needed now. When can Ontario students Question. expect to see these changes made and all of the recommendations from this report put into place? Thank you. Well, Speaker, I, I think we, we, we agree. We have, a, we have strong agreement on this issue, and I do want to acknowledge the people from, from Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance, from the, uh, Canadian, or the uh, College Student Alliance, colleges, the university sector, coming together to create one report. Is, is unprecedented. We have very good advice now, and we welcome that advice. But this is not the beginning, Speaker. We have made significant investments uh, recently and in the past. Um, over, since 2012, we've invested uh, uh, $30 million to improve mental health supports and services 
for our post-secondary students. Beginning in 2017-18, we plan to invest another $45 yes, million over the next three years in student mental health and well-being. This is important work, Speaker. It is important that we Thank all you. address this issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for also, Speaker happens to be a fellow Etobicoke MPP from Etobicoke Lakeshore. Speaker, I'm uh, very pleased to learn about more developments in the great riding of Etobicoke North, which include a $400 million expansion of Etobicoke General Hospital, a $2 billion expansion of the Finch LRT, wow. a brand new spanking uh, student centre at uh, Humber College, and so much more that's going on in the riding. Speaker, in particular to the minister, the premier joined Mayor Tory and the minister around the, to announce the leveraging of surplus provincial lands at Kipling and Finch in my riding to create new affordable housing units. And of course, Speaker, as you will know, housing is of course a significant expense for people in their day-to-day -day lives. Helping people find suitable, affordable, and appropriate and uh, Question. housing is absolutely critical. Speaker, therefore, I'm delighted to see how the government is moving to create affordable housing units in Thistletown in the Panorama Court area. Speaker, my question is, can the minister please tell us more about how this welcome Thank development— Thank you. Minister, <laughs> minister Housing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank uh, the member from Etobicoke North for his outstanding advocacy for the community of Etobicoke North. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we understand uh, the growing pressures that many Ontarians face in uh, their desire to uh, own a home or even to rent a home. That's why we announced our fair housing plan back in April, Mr. Speaker. It was a very comprehensive package of measures which included uh, taking surplus provincial lands and allowing them to be redeveloped for much-needed housing. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I was pleased to uh, be with uh, Premier Wynne as she announced uh, the release of the Thistletown lands for the creation of a new residential community, which will include 35 per cent of all the new housing units there as affordable. Answer. Some will be affordable rentals, some will be affordable home ownership, and there will be large-sized family units as well as part of that redevelopment, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to uh, thank my fellow MPP from Etobicoke, also the Minister of Housing, with reference to that answer. Uh, first of all, Speaker, I'm not sure if I've mentioned the extraordinary developments going on in Etobicoke North, which include the $400 million expansion of Etobicoke General Hospital, the $2 billion expansion of the Finch LRT, with eight stops, eight stops count them, within my own writing, custom designed for my residents. And, Speaker, in particular to the Minister, as in the capacity as the Minister of Housing, I'm especially pleased to learn, as he's just detailed, the Thistletown site, which is, by the way, a 48-acre beautiful site within my own riding, which will include green space, a new community, and a, a range of housing options. And, Speaker, I understand that the multiple measures that the minister is undertaking as part of the Fair Housing Plan will yes, not only benefit my own <laughs> constituents in Etobicoke North, but beyond. Speaker, my question is, could the minister please elaborate on how the Fair Housing Plan is helping to create more fairness Thank and you. opportunity in the province? Thank you. Even shorter. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke North for both posing the question and almost giving the answer as well. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our uh, comprehensive Ontario Fair Housing Plan included a number of measures in addition to releasing lands to create thousands of new affordable units across the province. We expanded rent control to all Ontario tenants, Mr. Speaker. We limited the above guideline increases uh, that landlords uh, could charge. We're working on a standard lease that would protect both tenants and landlords across this province with common language and common conditions for residential lease. Mr. Speaker, we also brought in measures Answer. to tamp down on rampant speculation that increases housing prices. Mr. Speaker, the announcement yesterday is another example of fair Thank housing you. being brought to Ontario. Great answer. The member from the member from Scarborough Agent Court on a point of order. Yes, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. I want all of us to wish the Minister of Community Social Service a happy birthday. Oh, thank you. 
Member from Prince Edward Hastings on a point of order. Speaker, point of order. I had a really good question I wanted to ask this morning, but because of the length of the question. Uh, first of all, that's, that's very insulting to the Speaker, and I take offence to that. I also have some sad news. I'm, I apologize. I apologize to the members. This is the last day for our pages. We, we, we do want to thank them for their service to Ontario and appreciate very much the work that they've done. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.